Welcome back to the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Last time I said we'd be starting the dungeon and that was kind of a half lie. We're gonna be starting it after doing a bit more of the Happy Mask side quest. First we want to grab the Spooky Mask and it isn't really immediately, um, what's the word? Apparent who the person that we're supposed to give this mask to is. But we did talk to them before, and they did say something about wanting to look a bit more spoopy. So, we're heading back to the graveyard in the daytime, and we're going to be talking to that little kid. The kid that said he wanted to look more like Dompe. The spooky mask doesn't really have any special effect. There is some funny dialogue that you can get with it. If you talk to the carpenter that's in front of the tree at Kakariga Village, like, as soon as you enter... He'll say something along the lines of, that's some real quality wood you got there, kid. Innuendos everywhere. Anyway, the mask costs 30 rupees, and the kid actually gives us the entire 30 rupees for the mask. Now we just have to make our way back to the happy mask shop, and this time I'm actually going to be showing some Hyrule Field. The reason why is because I wanted to show a little secret that I was talking about before. It pertains to collecting rupees. It's about this drawbridge that goes down. If you climb up it, at least on the chain, and you get all the way to the top, and then jump off on a side that's towards where the entrance is. It's so like, since I'm on the right side, I have to jump off to the left. You'll actually get 20 invisible rupees and fall through the ground. And apparently warp to the happy mask shop. No, I'm kidding. That was actually me editing. The next mask that we get is the Bunny Hood, and we're not going to be able to sell this mask for quite a while. But it's my favorite of the masks because it's just so adorable. And it has a little jiggle physics on the ears, which makes it even more adorable. And it has a special effect, at least. Again, I read that it has a special effect. I'm not sure if it actually works. The ability that it has is that if you wear it while just, you know, running around Hyrule Field at night, then no enemies will appear. At least, no stalled children will appear. Now though, we're getting back to plot. And in order to progress, we have to play Saria's Song for Darunia. If you talk to the Goron that's next to the shortcut to the Lost Woods, he'll say that Darunia really likes the music from the Lost Woods. And so, you have to play him the song to get him back in a good mood. Although, if you really wanted to get back into a good mood, and he, it was this song that would trigger that, he could have just, you know, stepped near where the shortcut was. I actually kind of don't want to say anything. I just want to bask in the glory that is Darunia's dancing. And I, I find that kind of funny right there, that Link kind of takes a couple steps back, like, what the hell is this guy doing? I actually really like this cutscene, and not just because that, you know, it's Darunia dancing, which is, you know, why would you not like the cutscene? But it kind of sets a precedent for the future, that the sort of leaders of these races are kind of quirky. They're not regal or super serious, they're weirdos. Like, Darunia likes to dance really weird and can't control himself when he hears good music. The Deku Tree, not so much. He's just kind of the stoic tree guy. Getting Darunia out of this depression, as he puts it, will get us a reward. He's not going to straight up give us the Goron Ruby. That's a bit too precious. But he is going to give us something very useful and something that will allow us to get the Goron Ruby and enter the next dungeon. He's going to be giving us the Goron Bracelet. The Goron Bracelet being, you know the bracelet-ish item for the game. In Zelda games, there's usually an item that'll allow you to lift up stuff or push stuff that you couldn't before, and this is the bracelet that does it. In this game, you can actually try to lift up the bushes that you can cut as well, but if Link attempts to do so, he'll just grunt and kind of not do it. But now that we have the bracelet, we can actually lift bushes and bomb flowers. And I'm about to show that here. There's this spinning thing in the center, like a totem. Well, it's not really a totem, it only has one head. But if you throw a bomb into the center of it, then it'll spin around really fast and 
depending on which face it lands on, you'll get a reward. If it lands on the sad face, then you'll get nothing. If it lands on the angry face, then you'll just get some rupees. And if it lands on the happy face, you'll get a piece of heart and 25 rupees. Not a bad reward. Something cool about the Goron bracelet is that it actually shows up on Link's model. You can probably see it there, but as Link walks around and such, you can see it on his left hand. Um, something that I didn't mention before that I actually am surprised that I didn't mention is that Link is left-handed. As you can see, he has his sword on his left side and the shield on the right side. If you're right-handed, you'd have the shield on the left side and the sword on the right side. And I think this might be the first game to actually like make sure that he's left-handed. Because in other games, they usually use reflected sprites. So if he's facing to the left, he'll use his left hand. If he's facing to the right, he'll use his right hand. But since they have to use a 3D model in this one, they made it concrete that Link is a lefty. In most of the games. In some games, he isn't, but we're not going to talk about whether or not he uses his left or right hand. Here's another example of a bit of sequence breaking. Since you lock onto the bomb, you want to throw it and then backflip off of the ledge. And there's a piece of heart on top that you'd normally have to get with a magic bean. This is kind of another example of the Gorons being stupid. There's a Goron that tries to roll down the mountain with a bomb in hand in order to break this boulder. But we just chuck a bomb over the ledge and it does it. Like, they seriously couldn't think of that. Something that might not be too helpful, but maybe will be, is that if you chop down a sign, be it by accident or on purpose, and then play Zelda's lullaby, that will repair the sign. Kinda weird that in order to enter the proper dungeon, you have to show that you're able to use the Goron bracelet again, but I guess they're just trying to make sure that you didn't glitch through. Here is the proper dungeon, Dodongo's Cavern. It's the fire dungeon, so you don't want to be bringing the Deku shield into this place, because it's made of wood, and wood catches on fire. So switch to the Hylian shield if you have it. If you don't, there are actually ways to get the Deku shield back. There are some chests that contain 5 rupees usually, but if you're out a Deku shield, then it'll be a Deku shield instead. And there are also some business scrubs around that... If you talk to them, well, first you have to reflect their seed back at them, so I don't know how you're going to talk to them unless you have the Deku shield. Maybe you could shoot a slingshot at them, or a slingshot seed at them, you don't want to shoot your entire slingshot. But if you do hit them with a bullet, then they'll probably be stunned, because that's how the mad scrubs work. The first chest that we're opening is the dungeon map, nothing too special. Those enemies that are around are called Bemos. Bemos are not fun. They like to shoot lasers at you. And Navi told us that there are fire pits all around. If you touch the fire, you'll gradually take damage as you stand on it. But you can just climb up this ladder over here if you fall into the pit. And you won't, you know, there won't be many repercussions for it. Bemos cannot be killed by anything except bombs. At least I'm pretty sure that's true. If there is another way to kill them, maybe like hitting them in the eye or something like that, I wouldn't know. There's going to be prevalent use of bombs in this dungeon. You're going to have to use them to open up doors or kill things. Or open up doors by killing things in this situation. These are baby Dodongos. They'll try to jump at you and if you attack them, they'll explode. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to wait for it to get near me, attack it, and then get away because... It'll flash red for a little bit, explode, and reveal a path. In this area is a golden sculptula and some keys. You want to kill the keys first with your slingshot from afar, because if they get close, they'll be drawn to the fire. And if they get in the fire, they'll become fire keys. And fire keys are more dangerous than regular keys in that they're on fire. That's all this room has to offer though, so we're going to continue on to the next one. Gonna avoid these baby Dodongos and put on our bunny hood because it's so adorable. And we're introduced to a new kind of switch. This one is blue. That means that if you push it down, it'll do something. But if you step off of it, it'll go back up. 
So what we have to do is place something on top of it, like this statue, and it'll stay permanently open. I like to call these rooms Mega Man hallways, because in Mega Man games, before there's a boss, there's usually a short hallway that kind of serves as a checkpoint. In this situation, there's kind of a boss past it. The enemies that appear are called Lizalfos. I'm going to be equipping the Deku Nuts because they're actually kind of useful. Lizalfos like to hit overhead, so what you can do is you can turtle up with the Hylian Shield and block their attacks. If you hit them with a Deku Nut, they'll be stunned and that'll give you enough time to do a jump attack, although if you're quick enough, you can do a jump attack regardless. The Zophos can't be hurt from afar. Usually, if you try, they'll do a little spin, like a spot dodge or something like that, and you can't hurt them. They also like to run around and jump away from you if you get too close. They kind of take turns. There's never going to be two of them attacking you at once. At least, I hope there isn't. Three jump attacks ought to do them, or six regular sword slashes. They can't really block your attacks, all they do is dodge, so if you want to go a bit, you know, trigger happy with the sword, I wouldn't blame you. And that's it, they're dead. Thus the door has opened. And they don't leave anything behind, they just kind of fade away. As for this room, there's some bombs and some pretty tough enemies. Bombing this wall over here will lead to a business scrub. I guess this will be sort of the first example of one. Although there were some near the forest stage, though we're not really going to get a good look at him because I realize who he is and then I leave because I don't need anything from him. I think he sells you Deku 6 for a ridiculous price, so I really don't want to talk to him. These are actual Dodongos. The way that you fight them is that you have to hit their tails, unlike the baby Dodongos they have armor all over the place. I think four sword slashes to the tail will do them in, and if you attack them with your sword, then they'll kind of do a little sweeping thing where they spin around, hitting with the tail, that little tail sweep they do, it's not, you know, healthy. You'll take quite a bit of damage actually. For some reason here, I only have to do a sword slash and one jump attack, which usually would amount to three hits. I suppose they're like extra weak to jump attacks or something like that. I don't know what it is. But this one is going to take two jump attacks, just like normal. I guess that one was special? I don't know. The goal in this room is to light up a Deku stick and take it to all the torches before one of the torches goes out. Yes, they love reusing this old puzzle. Massive air quotes around the word puzzle. Finishing this up will allow us to go into this room, which is actually a room that we have been to before already. This has a switch, and if you press on the switch, it'll unlock a door on the other side of the room. This is pretty much where we entered from. Well, the room that we entered the dungeon from, and the room that we exited into that side area from. And after going through that area, we can go into the left side. And the left side is a bit more exciting. As you can see, there are a ton of bombs, so I'm going to be ignoring them from the time being because there's a bombable wall here. And behind this bombable wall is a door. But behind that door is an enemy that we haven't encountered yet. It's called an Armos. Armos are special. They look like regular statues, but after you go up and touch them, they turn into actual demon spawn. And if you hit them with a bomb, they'll start to run around and go crazy, and then they'll explode. Thanks to the power of cutscene, I didn't take any damage from that explosion, but usually it'll do about a heart's worth. At least, I think it will. This treasure chest contains the compass, another item that isn't very useful because I know where everything is in the dungeon. Although I don't play with much finesse in this dungeon, well, at least this part of the dungeon. What you have to do here is you have to drop a bomb in the center of all of these and wait for it to cause a chain reaction, causing it to, I guess, hit two switches at the end, and this stairway will fall. There's a really slow way to get up the stairway. You climb up each step individually and Link takes his sweet time, but 
What I like to do is I like to look away from the stairway and do a bunch of backflips. And this will get you up pretty quickly. There are pots on either side that will get you a bunch of rupees. That one gave us 20. But I'm an idiot and I just decide to jump right off. Luckily with my black... Black flipping? Back flipping strat, I can get up there really quickly. Sadly, I am a dunce and I fall down again. I... <laughs> I left that in because I thought it was kind of funny, actually. Not due to laziness, I swear. Please subscribe. On the other side, there's identical pots that have identical contents. 20 rupees, and since we're full on hearts, it actually gives us another rupee. Usually when you're full on items, or when you're full on a specific item that the pot always drops, it'll give you a rupee. There's another gold sculpture up on this wall, and if you kind of see a, a way ahead, there's another gold sculpture all the way over there, but we can't get to it right now because we're not properly equipped to do that. And here are fire keys. They are annoying because they'll set you on fire if they touch you. If you are set on fire, you can roll or do a sword slash and you'll take the fire out pretty fast. I'm not sure if fire actually does lingering damage in this game because I've been on fire for quite a while and not have not seen a change in my heart count. Maybe there is, because the way hearts work in this game is they aren't actually counting fourths, they're counting eighths. If you take an eighth of a heart of damage, it won't show. And then if you take another eighth, then it will show as you taking a fourth of a heart of damage. This room has a bunch of narrow hallways, and Navi wants to Navi wants to protect you. She'll say, you never know we'll be around the corner. So, Z-target stuff. By Z-target stuff, she means just change your point of view. Because Zelda games don't really have the ability to use a second analog stick. At least early on they didn't, then they did, and then they didn't again. In this small chest, there's 20 rupees. Pretty neat. Now I'm full. And there's this bomb here. You need to time your bomb throw so that it hits all the way over there. Uh, the way bomb flowers work is a bit weird. I say this considering something that we're going to be getting to later. But the fuse is pretty long, so it's it's difficult for me to time a bomb throw with them. Climbing up this ladder and going into the next room, we're going to need our slingshot because there's an eye switch here. I think this might be the first yellow eye switch we've encountered before we saw a silver one. There is a difference between the silver and yellow ones, but it's not its not very useful to know what it is right now, so I'm not going to talk about it. It puts out the fire temporarily. If you wait around too long, then the fire will go back on. And now we have some more Lizafos to fight, and he doesn't want to slash at me. This one I'm going to be going a bit more gung-ho. I'm going to be slashing without using the Deku Nuts, because that's too slow. And I'm trying to go super fast. I mean, this part would be really long if I tried to draw out every enemy encounter. So I'm just going to try to take them out as quickly as possible. The floor in this room is a bit smaller. There's more fire pits, and the places that you can stand are compact. So you won't have as much maneuvering room, though with the Hylian shield you won't need as much maneuvering room. There's a bit that's kind of sticking out to the north. If you go to that area, there are some hearts that you can pick up. But if you fall down, you'll actually fall into the previous area where you fought Lizalfos. So I'm not going to risk going for those hearts because I don't want to have to go through a lot of the dungeon again. There's another eye switch here that we have to shoot to make the fire go away. But there's a second platform with more fire. So there's a second switch we have to shoot. Navi will actually head toward that switch, and I guess that's supposed to be your hint that there is a switch over there. There's another big treasure chest, and we already got the map and compass, so this must be the dungeon item. The item for this dungeon is actually one we've already had experience with, which is pretty neat. It's a bomb bag, and it contains bombs, so now we can pretty much control when we have bombs and throw them at will. The fuse is also shorter for these bombs, which again makes stirring them a bit weird when you're used to 
using bomb flowers and the other way around. There was a bombable wall back there, but it didn't have anything important. I think there might have been a business scrub or something like that, but I don't want to deal with him. And I'm pretty sure no one wants to see me deal with him. However, this bombable wall I will deal with. Behind this wall is 5 rupees. I don't know why I'm grabbing it because I'm already full on rupees and in this game if you open up a rupee chest while full on rupees, you won't get them. But I just opened it for the sake of opening it, I guess. There was a little stone slab over there that said that you have to turn this Dodongo's eyes red. And in order to do that, you have to basically put bombs in the eyes. Going back to the whole the Dongo dislike smoke thing from Zelda 1, I suppose. And a new path is revealed inside of the Dodongo's mouth. Even though it does kind of look like a skull, and it shouldn't have these kinds of mechanisms, I suppose. There's some fire keys in this room, and there's going to be a lot more fire keys in the tail end of this dungeon. Again, my strategy is that I like to wait for them to get up close to me, and then either shoot them with a slingshot or use a vertical slash. Using a horizontal slash or a stab just doesn't give you enough vertical distance to hit them well. If a fire key is to hit you, you will catch on fire, you know. It's like they're made of fire or something. And they'll turn back into normal keys. Since there's no more fire around this room, I don't think they'll be as aggro because fire keys are actually more aggressive than the regular keys. In this room, there's an Armos guarding a Skulltrilla. You want to wait for the Armos to kind of push you back a bit and then use the bomb because that way he'll kind of run into the bomb on his own. If an enemy runs into a bomb, it'll pretty much explode, like on contact. And if you chuck a bomb at an enemy, it'll pretty much explode on contact. So they're pressure sensitive that right there me like going in and out of the slingshot screen it's something I have a problem with in this game if you hold the slingshot button you'll ready a shot if you try to put the slingshot away by pressing the A button you're still gonna be holding the C button to not waste that one shot so it'll keep taking you in and out of the screen until you press the B button and swing your sword thus putting away the slingshot for good. I didn't mention it before, but there is actually a blue switch at the center of this room, and the fire keys are being really annoying, and I don't want to have to deal with them, but they're going to be mean to me, so I'll just be mean to them first. After taking care of these keys, though, I can finally push this block in some peace and quiet. There's one more key to deal with. Yeah, just kill it. Kill it, please, Link. Uh, don't go for the block. Kill it. Jeez. I just fly around so sporadically that the, the wall is glitching out. Anyway, we have to pull this block. Well, push it, rather, because if we pull it, we'll fall into the hole first. We have to push this block into the hole, and it'll hold down the switch for us. Thus, we'll be able to gain entry into the boss room, signified by the little skull on the side there. That's actually been in the previous dungeon too, but I just didn't mention it. Now that the door is open, we can enter it, fade to black, and then fade right back in. The way to enter the boss arena is that you have to plant a bomb, and luckily there is a chest with some bombs in here. It contains, like, a bunch. I don't know how many because I only had wasted one at that point. But, now we're in the boss arena, and it's time to bomb some Dodongos. That's a really big Dodongo to bomb. On a little side note, those are the only Zelda games that I haven't played, the CDI games. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's from a CDI game. Maybe. Anyway, Infernal Dinosaur King Dodongo. The strategy for this boss is that he's going to open his mouth and start inhaling. After he does so, you want to throw a bomb into his mouth and then do an attack to him. He'll start rolling around the arena for a little while. I think he'll hit two corners and then go back into a, a fighting stance. The way to avoid the roll is either hug the side and do a roll yourself, go to where the lava pit is, kind of on the edge, or you can tuck into your shield and he'll just cause a lot of sparks but not actually damage you. 
if you let him charge up all the way, he'll shoot a huge fireball that I think it actually turns corners, and it's pretty hard to avoid besides going into the lava, probably. But this last attack should do him in. And his death scene is kind of odd. He bumps into this wall, and then he rolls into the lava himself. Like, I don't feel accomplished like that. He just kind of killed himself. Overall, he's a very easy boss fight, though not as cheesable as the Goma one, except for the shield trick. We're gonna take his heart, and next time, we're gonna have a little bit of plot, a little bit of side stuff, and a lot of progressing toward the next dungeon.